isn't easy. Drawing for animation design isn't easy. If it was easy, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to go to school for it. Right. You and know? everyone would be doing it and everyone yeah. would be in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a competitive field and yeah. you know, anything that has to do with talent, you're competing with the hot shots and it's like, okay, that just means you just have to step up your game and you have to be willing to take the challenge and, 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 and the struggles and everything that go with it. But you know, no one dies from it. You're going to be okay. This is drawing. <laughs> right. you know? So it's like, welcome that you should, you know, don't, wor you know, don't worry about falling, fall as much as you can, but just get yourself up and just go forward. What, you know, drawing uh, falling down is expected. You know, welcome to the industry. I fall down every Monday when I get an assignment. All right. Welcome everyone. Uh, Today, I am hosting John Navarez. We're doing our inter interview with John Navarez. John and I go back uh, quite a ways. I'm really excited to, um, to have you back, John. So thank you for coming. Well, no, thanks, Mike, for inviting me again. This is awesome. You know, I yeah. just remember, gosh, what was it, 15 years ago when we did this? And uh, that was awesome. You're right. It was, it was 15 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, anytime I, I'm you know, chatting with you, meeting up with you. I, I love it. So this is great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so everyone, in case you don't know who John is, um, John, I, I have to say, is I think one of the best uh, concept artists out there uh, in the animation industry more specifically. I know you've crossed into games a little bit too, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I know what my abilities are, and I think what my skill is at, and I think I'm pretty fast. But when I saw you draw, I was like, damn. I think this guy's outpacing my hand skill. <laughs> uh -huh. It's so quick and so comfortable with your skills. At that time in pencil, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll demo traditionally or digitally today, but I was really blown away. I was blown away with how comfortable you are and uh, the sort of fearlessness that you draw with. You know, I'm still teaching, obviously, today. That's like my main job again. And I think one of the things I talk to students most about is just being confident, right? Like, just being able to get the ideas out on a piece of paper, right? Yeah, just throw it down. I mean, I was, yeah. uh, I mean, I think I, when I, I started as a storyboard artist, we were kind of like, we were expected to throw it down fast. And that was good training for me. It just kind of, I realized you have to throw, throw it down fast. And uh, over the years, I realized you just got to just draw with no fear and let the thing kind of, uh, what do you call it? You have to mold it. You have to massage it. You know, it's not going to come out perfect or pretty. You just have to just throw the idea down and work it. Yeah, I love that. Let's keep talking about that kind of stuff today. That's like the hardest thing to convince our new artists on is just uh, to your jargon to just throw it down to right get beyond the preciousness of it and. Yeah. And you know, once it's down on the paper, you can see it, right? That's when you work it instead of holding it all in your head the whole time, and it creates this barrier, I think, between you and the work. Yeah, no, because I don't know what it is either, and you know, uh, I kind of have an idea, but it's like, you know what? I just gotta. It's almost like you gotta like throw something down, knowing it's not right, but then you have to try and, uh, you know, with with gut instinct or kind of what you have in mind. You have to try and get it to where you want it to go, but you have to have something there first. You just got to have something on paper to work with. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, that helps. Also, a little bit of fear helps because, you know, you have a deadline, you know, you got to like deliver <laughs> this. Yeah. So it's like you got to like, okay, just kind of, you know, spit it out and just let it work. And just trust that, trust that process, the, the process of just, you know, you will get there. Eventually. Yeah, you're, you're bringing in fear in the right way, in a sense, or what I think one of the healthier ways is which is not fear to draw but concern over i have a timeline right so there it's helping motivate you to work harder and faster right yeah it is um yeah. you know because it's like um it, it's just uh, you know you're just trying you're trying to find an idea or, or something to to kind of your target so um you know you have these general ideas but you throw it down knowing like okay something is there but you're trying to like maybe uh clarify it more or or you know make it more solid to one idea or or statement or or a fluid line or whatever i mean depending on what it is it could be line drawing it could be a story sketch or some kind of vision moment you're just trying to you know you're you're kind of like a dj you're trying to touch all these buttons to try and get something to like that note you're trying to hit 
Right. Yeah. Hierarchy. Right. And like yeah. you said, massaging. I always think of it like a lump of clay, right? You're just throwing this lump of clay down and you're, you know, you've got to slowly massage it. You don't go in and try to like sculpt the eyeball in a lump of clay. You're trying to get the general shape and form of things and you keep working in tighter and tighter to find the answer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Big ideas. And then you go to the small ideas, you know, you don't start in the corner and just work your way in. Some people can do that. Yeah. Uh, you got to like consider the whole piece. Right. Yeah. So God, we just jumped right in there. <laughs> I wanted to give all of you a general sense of John's amazing um, background, right? Uh, so John, you went to, um, you started off over in UC Santa Barbara. And from there, it's been this um, amazing uh, career, this roller coaster ride uh, across pretty much every animation studio there is, all, especially all the big ones, right? So we have Walt Disney TV, um, we have Pixar Animation, Walt Disney Studios, Ken Duncan Studios, uh, Illumination, uh, Sony, uh, Warner Brothers, right, recently, and also uh, Paramount uh, yeah. Studios. Briefly, yeah. Uh, yeah, so pretty much all the big ones. And uh, yeah, really impressive, crazy ride. And, and later, I would like to talk about, you know, what that's like. Are you always, you know, are you going in studio, out of studio? Is it freelance? Is it full time? Does it work from home? Because I'm sure you've probably done every one of those different uh, work experiences too. Oh no, just I've been lucky to bounce around and just kind of I've been lucky enough to uh, to work in house and 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 remotely and mm -hmm. uh, I, you know there's great things in both. But I love where I'm at now. You know, yeah. it's, it's good. So let's talk about childhood, right? I like. Um, I like talking to all of the uh, interviewees about where it all started for them. Uh, you know, where did you grow up and what were your initial inspirations? Was somebody, somebody in your family drawing? Like, what got you started? Let's see. Well, I, I was born and raised in East L.A. You know, yeah. that song, uh, Born East L.A. I was literally born in East L.A. And I was, my, the hospital I was born in was actually uh, probably half a mile from where I was end up living. And I didn't know that until I was in high school. So, yeah, I mean, East L.A. is probably a working class uh, Latino neighborhood. And mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a gardener. Uh, he was working for the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale. Mm -hmm. He was doing that full time. And then on the weekends, he would do like maybe four or five private yards just to earn extra money. And I became his assistant, you know, reluctantly. He kind of said, you're getting up at, with me at six in the morning. We're going to have breakfast. <laughs> you know, we're going right. to do this Saturday morning. So that was, that was, that was my, that was my, uh, I guess my part-time job. And my mom was a seamstress. She, uh, mm -hmm. she worked in downtown LA in the garment district. And she did, she worked for uh, several, I guess, garment uh, warehouses. And she would just make like, I remember she'd bring, like shorts and shirts and just whatever clothes she just kind of she was doing that um yeah went to uh garfield high school um it was great i mean i loved it it was just it was uh it was very modest you know we just kind of everybody worked hard and uh i know east like kind of has this bad vibe um i loved it you know um know. you know but um uh, did you it's interesting, you know, both your parents seemed very hardworking. I mean, did you glean something off of that? And it's interesting you mentioned the word modest. So that's my first question is your parents. And question two is modest. Uh, you know, I, I tell everyone this quite honestly. And in fact, um, Gary's video, his interview will be coming out a month prior to yours. And I talk about you in his interview and <laughs> oh. in saying how I think you're probably one of the you know, most kind and generous people I've ever met. So, uh, oh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Uh, no. So, and so you mentioned, you happen to mention modest and you're so damn modest, you know, and you happen to label the school like that is, you know, where did this all come from? Right. You're, you're so darn skilled and egoless and super modest and hardworking. And already you just mentioned the two things that I, that are in my mind when I think about you right off the cuff with your parents and the neighborhood and school you grew up in. Yeah. I mean, there's just, I mean, they were just hardworking and it's like, you just kind of, they never complained. Uh, you know, my dad, uh, technically he's my stepdad, but for, you know, he's my dad. He raised, he, you know, he, sure. he raised me and, uh, he always had a strong work ethic. I mean, he's one of these, uh, He's on, you know, he's one of these, uh, you know, uh, 
vintage Mexicano dads who just kind of took a lot of shit, didn't say anything, and he worked hard. And, um, you know, we weren't rich. We weren't rich at all. Uh, but I remember, you know, we always, you know, he always provided for us. And I kind of, I guess, you know, I looking back and I guess I got, I, I appreciated a strong work ethic from him. Um, I'm so glad he forced me to be his assistant. I mean, I didn't ask to be his assistant. He just said, you're coming with me. <laughs> right. And my mom said, you know, she said, yeah, you know, you're going to help him. And I hated that. But then I grew to love it because it gave me a routine. It, I, it gave me a sense of appreciation for working hard and earning stuff. My dad would pay me like 20 bucks after uh, doing like five or six houses. And I remember I'd come home sweaty and smelly, dirty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we'd wait up at six or 6.30. We'd come home about like 1.30 or two. And I was tired, but it felt good after a while. You know, I still remember the, the smell of fresh cut grass because, you know, that was all around you. And, as I was working, my dad would give me a 20. He didn't have to, uh, but for me, that was a lot of money at the time. Sure. Um, you know, I just appreciated that. It wasn't so much the money, but after a while, I just like, just uh, doing something and and going through, going through the process of trying to, you know, make something happen. I mean, for us, it was cleaning yards, but right. I just remember, um, you know, all that hard work that my dad did. And then my mom did too. I mean, she, she had sacrifices too. She kind of, I remember uh, when me and my sister, when we were young, she kind of, when I say young, we were probably in, I was in fourth grade or third grade. My sister was in second. We were, we were, we were in LA. And then she took me and my sister to uh, Tulare, California, which is in central California. It's just north of uh, Bakersfield mm -hmm. uh, to live with my grandma because she, um, she needed to, um, to to do extra jobs to raise more money to help kind of bring us back. You know, right. my mom, you know, she wasn't married at the time, so she was trying to do all these extra jobs. So we lived in Central California for three years. That was cool. And then when once my mom had enough money, and then she met my dad, then she brought us back. I and see. Um, yeah, and that was that was. I mean, I I look back on it, and that was that was a big sacrifice she did. And I remember, yeah. uh, I mean, later on, she sure, you know, I was told, yeah, she cried a lot by the time we, we were separated. But yeah. I mean, she did that just to try and seek something better. And you know, it's interesting. I just watched a thing on Disney Plus about a character designer at Disney TV whose name I don't recall off the top of my head, but he, he, I think he's from Colombia, if I'm not mistaken, and his mom really wanted a better life for him and his sister. So she moved to the US without them, right? And le left them with, pa with family for also three years. Yeah. It took her three years to get into like the US and get herself established and save enough money and then finally brought them over into the United States. And, uh, and even when he was really young, he said, I wanna work for Mickey Mouse. And now he's uh, his character designer at Disney TV. And it was the same, same kind of scenario, you know, like just, Having well, to do what you got to do. Yeah, it was all yeah. ironically around the same amount of time that you're mentioning. It was right around three years, I think he said. Gosh, yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I'll, I'll invest, yeah, hopefully I can find uh, who that is. Yeah, if you look on Disney Plus, it's, there's a couple of, you know, documentaries they have about behind the scenes mm -hmm. uh, scenarios. And one of them shows you different people that work across the, the parks and the different jobs, animation and Imagineering and so on, and they interview um, them. So, cool. yeah, check it out. Um, so, what you know you ended up going to uc uh santa barbara what led you there was it art that led you there did you go there for art no i was uh the how i got there was in high school i went to garfield high school mm -hmm. and um you know i took a few ap courses uh i took ap calculus mm. and a lot of my friends were engineering minded you know they were they were going toward the sciences or engineering so i would take classes with them i really didn't have a pretty much a, a, a direction where I wanted to go, but I would take classes with them and I would fulfill all the, all the collegiate courses, you know, as far as getting you ready to go to college. Right. And um, I remember one of our teachers was Jaime Escalante, who is, um, he was the calculus teacher at, at, uh, at Garfield. And he's kind of famous for that movie, Stand and Deliver. He's the one who kind of came in and taught, uh, you know, 
the, uh, these high school kids who didn't get anything beyond, who weren't taught anything beyond algebra. He taught them calculus and he geared them toward the AP calculus test. And, and if you see the movie, they originally um, thought that they had cheated. The testing board thought they had cheated. I see. Uh, that there were, you know, there were, there were hints of like maybe the testing board were, were considering you know, that it was racist to consider that they cheated. Anyway, they were forced to take the test again, and a lot of them got the high scores. And it kind of put Garfield on the map as far as you know what High Mescalante had uh, set up. Anyway, he was he was my teacher, and that's cool. I, um, you know, he made teaching fun, and I convinced myself that oh maybe I should do math because I thought it was a safe job, like I can actually get a good safe job right doing that. So. Um, I went to UC Santa Barbara because some of my friends were going to UC Santa Barbara and they had a good program and so forth. So I went there um, kind of headstrong that I was going to, you know, pursue math and maybe become like somewhere in the sciences or maybe even maybe being an accountant or something like that. Something that I do with math. Right. I did that for two years and then I got kicked out of school because oh. I had poor grades. I basically realized I, didn't really like math and uh, <laughs> math wasn't for me right and uh, I remember taking the final for uh, for uh, it was like a spring semester and there was eight questions uh, we go into the to the to the room and I get I, I'm right there I go in the back of the class I'm looking at these eight questions and we have three hours to do the test so I'm there looking at the test and I'm just kind of like you know I raise my head and I'm just looking out and I'm just you know, I'm just there's <laughs> having an epiphany, thinking like right. I don't belong here. Yeah, and I I was there for like an hour, an hour and a half, just like okay, I gotta make some changes. And then I you know I turned the test. Uh, yeah, and then eventually I got a letter from the the dean of the school saying he wants to see me. I saw him. I pleaded my case, and I told him I had a letter of uh, dis. I was gonna be dis uh, academically disqualified. Mm -hmm. So I had to like plead my case and I told him like, you know what, I think I'm gonna pursue art because I think that's something I, I, I can do. And he goes, that's great, but you're not gonna do it here. And he kicked me out. Really? And, yeah. And uh, so, I went back to UCLA. So, so did, you, did you draw as a kid or were you just had this thought at this moment where you're getting kicked out of the school? Ah, I think I'll try art, math's not my thing. I, I, I always drew as a kid. I remember seeing, I remember the first thing I drew was dinosaurs mm -hmm. uh, because we used to live in uh, near uh, USC mm -hmm. and the exposition museum, they had this natural history museum, really cool museum right. with all these. I remember we'd go there a lot and I would always kind of collect these cast iron dinosaurs and I would always draw the dinosaurs. Um, and I, my mom drew, my mom drew. So she kind of, it was great. She would encourage us to draw, but it was weird that I never really thought I could make a career out of it. I did, I remember in high school, I was thinking like, oh, maybe art, but then it, again, I, you know, I didn't know that you can make a career out of it. I always thought it was more of a hobby. Right. Or something. Uh, animation at the time, it was, wasn't really on radar. You know, it had been done, I mean, uh, I think the last movie that was done before was, uh, what do you call it? The Rescuers. Right. But there was nothing like, there wasn't like the, the frequency of movies that are on now animated. There wasn't a lot of that. So I just kind of thought like, okay, I'll just kind of do something more, uh, how, how can I say this, more practical. Yeah. What about comics? Were you a comic book collector or read comics? Yeah, I did uh, Marvel and DC. Yeah, I collected as a comics. I would, I would, I would always collect comics uh, when I was a kid. What about them? Did you ever think about, did you draw from comics or think, oh, maybe I could be a comic book artist or it was, again, it was just pure hobby. It was pure hobby. I was always, a, I was a kid in high school who always, everybody knew who could draw. So I would, I would always get approached by, can you help me out? Can you draw this? Right. I, I remember right. doing that. Right. Uh, but I just, uh, yeah, for some reason, I, I don't know why I didn't pursue it. Um, right. I mean, I remember it was on the back of my mind, like, oh, maybe I should, but I think somehow I must have convinced myself like it wasn't it wasn't a practical thing to do. I think I was I was more worried about like I needed to get a job to make money, and then maybe it was more of like I wanted to be 
um, taken seriously as like it was a, it was a real job versus right. art. But that right. was that was my mistake. I I didn't I mean I didn't pursue it enough, uh, you know, to find to 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 find the real, you know, I guess what the real deal as far as what art could be. Yeah, you know, I think I think I bought in to think like, oh, you know, you can't make money off art, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And if you're not exposed to that, how would you really know, right? Yeah. I just kind of, you know. Uh, I mean, I was, I was, um, uh, as I was in high school, I didn't know that there was Cal Arts. I knew there was an art center, oh. um, you know, and, and I, I knew there was Rhode Island School of Design. Those are the three schools I kind of knew were, exist as far as where to go. Mm -hmm. But then I, it's funny, I think I, I considered it, but for some reason, I think I was, I just held myself back thinking like, okay, no, you need to get a quote unquote real job. Right, 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 right. So the figure drawings that I have, when, well, before I jump to the figure drawings, how, so you decide to go into art. What does that mean? Did you go to a college then to learn how to draw, how to improve your skills? Like what happened next? Well, well when, after I got kicked out of uh, <laughs> yeah. Santa Barbara, I went back home to East LA. I was really depressed. I yeah. felt like I was a loser. Um, so first thing I did was I just got any spare jobs I could to help pay rent. So one of the first jobs I got was I worked for Track Auto, mm -hmm. uh, which was very much, you know, kind of like, uh, uh, gosh, you know, just like, the, you know, the, these auto parts stores where you can kind of right. get anything. Uh, so I worked in the warehouse and I remember I would be stock, I would be stocking the items and so forth. So I got that because it was the only job available. And uh, I, I remember, I remember vividly where I had to find a job and I remember things were tough. And my, I didn't know how to drive. I didn't know how to drive until I was 25. Wow. And I remember my mom was taking me, uh, she took me to the interview and then I, I got the job. And I remember I was so happy that I got a job that the next thing I had to do was I had to go to a, a warehouse store to buy um, steel toe shoes. So I, I got this, these steel toe shoes and then I remember the drive on the way home and I was happy and then I remembered on the way home, uh, I was, my mom was driving and I was like, huh, I got a job that I don't want. I, I, I got a job that I needed to do and here I am. Right. And I realized, oh, this, I'm not happy. I wasn't happy before, but I realized I, I, uh, I need to do what I do, but I just, I just, I just, I remember I just felt like I'm not happy. Yeah. And my mom was like, just really supportive. She says, you know, sometimes you just, you know, you got to do things and, you know, it's going to be okay. And, you know, working is good. And, you know, she was just trying to help me as far as like, you know, it's going to be okay. This is, right. you know, you will eventually find what you want. But, you know, she, she was really encouraging like that. She was always kind of had our back and always said like, you know, it's going to be okay. Right. So, uh, yeah. So I would do odd jobs, warehouse jobs. And then, while I'm doing all this, I was going to East LA College and I took a drawing class every Wednesday night from seven to 10 to cheer myself up. I just did, <laughs> I, I needed to draw. So I did that and I did that for three years that I actually had enough credits to, uh, to go back to UC Santa Barbara. Is that where the figure drawings come in? Yeah, it was mostly figure drawing. And then eventually I took like a graphic design class. This is old school graphic design where you know, they had the letter sets where everything had like a, a roller. You know, it wasn't everything, was, it wasn't digital at all. Everything was just kind of, yeah, you had an X-Acto knife and you had to like, you know, put it up. But yeah, I remember, um, yeah, we just did mostly life drawing. Is that what these, is this the time period that we're looking at here, these drawings? No, that was, this was more, when, yeah, this is, these are more like after, um, uh, after, UC, after UC Santa Barbara. So this is, these, these were more like when I started uh, Disney, like in 97. So you get kicked out of school, you do a bunch of odd jobs, you started drawing once a week at night, yeah. you went to the school, you took enough classes to build up credits, and then you got back into UC Santa Barbara, but in their art program? In their art program, and it was a fine arts program. So. Okay. The, the only animation class they had was, uh, it was part of their film studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had to like be a film studies major to kind of go in that program. So I took more of the fine art route. 
So it was a lot of basic foundational life drawing, sculpture, ceramics, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then I mostly did a lot of just life drawing stuff because I just, I love drawing. Right. So I graduated with a studio arts major, which was the equivalent of a fine arts major. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I graduated and I, I had this portfolio of life drawings, but I didn't really have any kind of thing, anything kind of practical as far as what to do with it. Right. You know? And at the time that I graduated, the Lion King movie had come out. And that's what got me excited about animation. It, the, it wasn't, the Lion King was exciting, but the art of Lion King, the book, that right. got me excited. That's what woke my eyes up to animation. Cool. Uh, because I didn't make the connection. This is how naive I was. I was looking at animation and I, you know, I appreciated the movie and stuff like that. Right. And then I would originally, I would, whenever I saw animation art, I always saw the, the fine line art drawing, you know, the cleanup right. line. Right. But when I saw the art of book, I was like, I saw all this beautiful rough drawings. I saw like storyboards and I saw rough layout sketches and all this other stuff, character designs that were, you know, you could see the sketch marks and the, 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 just all the, all the, all the rough stuff before the cleanup. Right. And that kind of like, oh my God, you get a job doing that? <laughs> because I was used to doing this, the, 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 the rough line, you know, gestural stuff. And I didn't think like, oh, I really? I, I was trying, I was all of a sudden, I made that connection. Like, you know, like the light bulb went off, like, oh my God. So right. then I started changing gears and then I was trying to pursue all my energies toward like, okay, I want to get into animation. I got to get to there. I got to get to a studio. So this started my campaign of uh, over the first two and a half years, three, almost, yeah, almost two and a half years applying to all the animation studios. Um, so what was that process and, like? How did you find out what they even wanted, right? You only just had this epiphany because you saw an art of book, Yeah. right? So how did, yeah, how'd you go about learning what they were looking for? I would, you know, this is before the internet. So I would kind of like, you know, you would read an article or maybe some kind of ad. Mm -hmm. And eventually what happened was I would just cold call the studios. Uh, eventually they would have something, they, you know, there'd be something floating around that I would see that somebody had shared at CalArts saying like, okay, a portfolio requires this, this, this. I see. You know? So I didn't have all that because I just, you know, I just basically was, I had gesture drawings, I had live drawings, but I didn't have layout drawings. I didn't have story, but I didn't have anything of that. Right. So, um, so, but I remember applying with just my live drawings and um, I had over 24 rejection letters and stuff like that. Right. Um, I remember I took a class for Klasky Shupo doing storyboards for Rugrats. Didn't make it. Uh, Interesting. And there was another thing. So I just kept trying and trying, but I should have stopped, but I didn't because I just <laughs> thought like, okay, I got to keep doing, got to keep doing. Eventually I got to know the switchboard operators and I remember one switchboard operator at Disney TV saying like, oh, have you heard of the training program at Disney TV? Oh. I'm like, no. So she, uh, she, uh, she told me about it, I applied, and then I got a test. It was a storyboard test. And it was, it was uh, a model sheet of Ariel, a model sheet of King Triton, a model sheet of Flounder. I had a layout of a, of a galleon ship that was sunk in the water. And I had a like a half page of dialogue, and it was basically King Triton and Ariel having this back and forth dialogue. Uh, I forgot about what, and then Flounder comes in, and that was it. So they wanted, and they had storyboard panel paper. So they wanted you to kind of storyboard this 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 script and turn it in a week. Right, that's so, cool. Um, yeah, and I had no idea what to do because I never did a storyboard. I was just kind right. of off the art of book. I was kind of like, oh, there's progression i guess i don't know so, and I, I remember I, I did it one saturday night i was working for the gas company and i remember i went on a saturday night uh, uh on my floor it was the 30th floor um it was a saturday night i was i showed up like in the, at five in the afternoon i didn't leave till like midnight because i knew it was quiet it was a quiet place and i remember i was there just trying to take the test and i remember i almost gave up a lot of times right but um but I didn't. I just thought, like, this is my break. Right. So, did you get in on that? I did. Um, I didn't awesome. know. I, I didn't. I didn't get an answer for like a month or so. Wow. But, but yeah, basically, the program was um, they were looking for 
artists who had no experience but raw skills. And uh, they were going to teach them how to do storyboard, um, I guess, the Disney way, or at least kind of, you know, it was like film school and art school. You're going to be mentored. You were going to learn uh, all the ropes as far as storyboarding, plus everything else that would help with that, which would be gesture drawing, life drawing, anatomy, uh, improv classes, acting classes, all this stuff, in addition to the, the actual craft of learning boards, and you were being mentored. Right. So it was supposed to be a year-long program, and uh, this was in October 97. There was nine of us in the class, and we were only on, we were only in the course, we were only in the class for three months. Mm. So this was October, we take Christmas break, and we come back like January 3rd or 4th, mm -hmm. and then they say we're killing the program. Oh, and, and we were like, what? And yeah, apparently uh, during this time in 97, the Hunchback of Notre Dame had come out. Mm -hmm. And I guess it wasn't making the box office that Lion King had made. You know, Lion right. King was a fluke and it made lots of money. Right. So apparently, I guess, um, you know, there was another movie, I think, prior to Hunchback and then Hunchback came. So you had this kind of uh, dim slightly diminishing box office, and I guess that scared people that they had to make uh, cuts for right. the program because we weren't profit making. And so I remember they, they, you know, they told us in a room, like, you know, this is it. But um, the thing that saved my life was the director of the program, uh, Larry Johnson. He went up to bat for me. And the next week I found myself uh, on Pepper Ann uh, at Disney TV and I was a storyboard revisionist. Wow. And I was I was excited. I was 31 years old. Yeah. And I was like, wow. And I'm like, I have no idea what a storyboard revisionist was. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know what storyboards because we never got that far. Oh. <laughs> but uh, but that was that was my first that that was my introduction into the industry, and oh. I just learned on the job. It's interesting the little parallels we have. I. When I was younger, I also um, did stock for a while. I worked at Sears as a teenager. And then the Lion King thing's kind of a funny connection between us. I mean, as you know, that was my introduction. Like I got in through the Disney internship program as Lion King was in production and then moved on to Lion King. And I came in through a Disney internship, but I was down, I'm from New York. So I went down to Florida for that program. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I think the other really important thing here is uh, I love that you just mentioned your age at this because I, I have quite a few students come to me who might be in their mid or late 30s uh, or even late 20s and they'll say, you know, am I too old to get in? You know, and I'm like, no way. I mean, there's plenty of people that start much later than 23 years old. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, have to it, be like that. It, it, I, in this industry, it's not about age. It's about your book. Right. Because if you look at the book, no one really says, you know, no one cares where you're from or, right. or, or how old you are. It's what you can deliver. Right. right. Yeah. So. so you moved on from there. Um, I have a bunch of work that I knew you f uh, for when we first met. Um, so you said this was what year? We're in late 90s now, right? Yeah, late 90s. This must have been like probably late 90s, early 2000s. Mm hmm. So yeah. you're working at Disney TV, and what came next? Like, how long were you at Disney TV? And yeah, I was. At, uh, I started '97. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, '98 uh, was mm -hmm. when I kind of officially started at Disney TV. Mm -hmm. uh, first show was Pepper Ann, and I think I bounced around to the Weekenders. Uh, I did a show called Fillmore, and then I eventually landed on Kim Possible, and I, that's where I learned a lot because. Um, you know, I worked with a great crew and they were doing these really cool, you know, just, just a cool crew. They were just kind of just took chances doing really cool storyboarding and design. Did you meet, St it. did you meet Steven during that time? I was going to say, yeah, I, I, that's where I met Steve Silver. He was okay. awesome. He's one, one of my uh, earlier friends and still mm -hmm. is. He, and he was so inspiring. And uh, even back then, you know, Steve was just kind of thinking, you know, he kind of could see like, he saw the industry, but he could see like, you know, there's more to it and how one, an artist can do more with just their work. I mean, back then he was thinking about it and right. I remember I would approach him and yeah, he was just, you know, just gun ho and it's just so, you know, just so inspiring. Yeah. So, uh, and then, yeah, I remember uh, folks I remember working on earlier then was Justin K. Thompson. Justin was awesome. 
he was doing backgrounds for Kim Possible. He eventually would be one of the art directors for Spider-Verse. He was the uh, production designer, actually, to your point. Yeah, the PD, yeah. 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 So uh, he was great. I mean, we had such a great crew. Everybody, all the boarders, layout guys. I learned so much. Yeah. And then eventually from there, I took chances at, and, and I, I jumped over to design, but not by, I did that by, uh, what's a good way of saying this? I, I guess I forced my way into, into design. Uh, uh, right next to our crew, we would share floors. And on the, on, on the other side of the floor was a direct-to-video uh, production, uh, Cross New Groove. Mm -hmm. And um, I really wanted to be on the, on the show. Uh, and I remember I approached the, pro the producer, and she was really nice. I, you know, I told her, like, oh, I'm very interested in joining your crew. would love to do design. And I remember she was like, oh, okay, that's nice. But she knew I came from TV, <laughs> and she kind of just thought, like, okay, you're just a nice guy from TV trying to get it. It's like, you know, right. thanks, but no thanks. You know, we have enough people. Right. So, she, I, you know, she, she didn't really take me seriously, but she was, being, she was nice about it. So I was like, all right. So I remember over the course of, like, two months, maybe a month and a half, I, I would like always go by, check out the gallery, check out the work on the walls. And over the course of that time, a month and a half, uh, either uh, I think like two or three uh, background designers either quit, got fired, or just left. And I remember I just, um, they were down. I remember they were kind of like in this desperate mode where they were needing somebody. So right. I remember one day, uh, or one night, I should say, uh, I went home and I love I love the Ember's New Groove so much, so because I love the style and stuff like that. So yeah. I remember I did like maybe five pages thumbnails of all these um, villages and, and houses in that style of the show. Right. And I just kind of like you know did my best. I did a really simple in five pages sketches. And one night I went into their meeting room and I left it on the table. I put my name and my phone number. <laughs> and I'm thinking like I, I gotta go. I gotta go for broke. Yeah, so that's after, awesome. Uh, two days later, I got a call from the producer, and she was like, "Oh, uh, can we have a talk?" <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I go in, and they gave me they gave me a shot, and that was actually my first uh, attempt. Not attempt. That was my first design gig, and it, it was so awesome because I worked for a great crew. I got to work with Colin Stimson. Colin Stimson was the production designer for Crocs New Groove. Mm -hmm. and uh it was an education i i loved it and yeah. i got to learn um about design i worked with mary Lockatell, who was the art director she was awesome mm -hmm. uh yeah i i it was great and then from there i worked on tinkerbell and stuff like that and that that started more the design phase of things i was doing more biz dev and background design so that takes you i guess into the um into the early 2000s right it does yeah so what is what are these pieces here? Can you talk me through some of them? Yeah, these are just my own sketches uh, that I was just kind of experimenting with. Uh, yeah, that's from Tinkerbell. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the good thing about Tinkerbell, I was doing a lot more design, but via story moments. So it was a lot of these kind of um, you know exploratory uh, story sketches that we kind of try and find the design. This was Kim Possible mm -hmm. uh, that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, this was a sequence where I think Kim is battling this huge stone gorilla. Mm -hmm. So here I, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, it was great, you know, because we were like, it was, it was a high action movie. You know, it was, it was one of these shows where, you know, it was comedy, uh, high action. And so they really, you know, everybody was just doing these really cool action, you know, shots, very cinematic, you know, camera pans and truck ins, truck outs. So I was learning a lot of that there. Now these, I guess, are just your thumbnails, right? Because when, especially in TV, the boards are pretty strict, right? Yeah, because you're kind of you have to draw on these um, panel paper. So I right. you know, like this legal size paper with three panels. That's old school. And but here, I just did these on like just a large piece of paper, just just to throw something down. I mean, right. I think uh, I'm not even sure if I use this. I think I may have done this for a friend who was trying to plan out something. But yeah, you're just kind of figuring it out. This was for a sketchbook. Um, this was early on in the early 2000s, like 2003, four, when sketchbook sessions uh, was a was a 
popular forum back then where a lot of people could post and share their artwork. And it was actually the predecessor to what uh, eventually people would use a uh, blogger. They would do their own blogs. Right. And then Comic-Cons. Uh, I, I think I started Comic-Con when I was in 2004, 2003. Right. And that was kind of the start of me getting to learn all about, about a whole bunch of other artists doing the same thing, self-publishing. Um, you know, that was, this was like a good time where I was just exposed to so many awesome artists and were inspiring doing their own thing. Yeah. And it kind of lit a fire under your butt to do your own thing. So I was trying to do all this other stuff. These are all just for the sketchbook. I had an idea, like I was inspired by Lord of the Rings. So I was trying to riff on that. Mm -hmm. uh, this was for Brother Bear 2. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was trying to plan out a scene. Uh, yeah, for Tinkerbell. Uh, uh, the early version of Tinkerbell, there was a lot more Peter Pan. There was a lot more Peter Pan and the Lost Boys in it. Eventually right. the story had changed, but this was an early sketch for it. So this time period is right when I, I met you, because I moved out to Los Angeles in 2003, and then I started Entertainment Art Academy around 2004, 2005, something like that. Uh-huh, yeah. So I think you were at, you were probably Disney, I mean, yeah, Disney. Well, you I were would, on, you were on Tinkerbell, I think, when I met you. Yeah, time. so I was with Disney, but I, you know, I guess technically it's Disney Tunes, which actually was just the direct video division of, of the whole studio, so yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's cool. And talking about materials very quickly, um, when we met in the early 2000s, you were always working on this semi-slick 11 by 17 paper with soft graphites, like you had ebony and a couple, and I remember I always had like uh, tissue paper for like blurring out edges, right? Yeah, I would just, yeah, I would use the tissue paper or my finger, if it wasn't too <laughs> All right. And I would just kind of, yeah, just use it to kind of shade in or ghost in values so forth then i would use the eraser to, to erase out to get some whites mm -hmm. so that was old school and i you know i learned that from uh at the time i was like talking to paul felix a lot and his oh, brother yeah. phil uh, uh, phil felix uh paul's older brother was one of my first mentors mm. and uh, he was awesome i mean they're both great but yeah they're both uh, awesome phil, phil was my my mentor and he was you know guiding me on how on on, on crafting design and so forth so yeah yeah, they became, I mean, Paul is, you know, uh, like a cornerstone designer at Disney Feature Animation, right? He's been there quite some time now. Yeah, yeah, he's been there for, I don't know, I, it, has, it has to be like over 25 years, 30 yeah. years maybe. Yeah, no, yeah. you're right. Yeah, because he started Disney TV. Um, and, he, and, and when I started Disney TV in 97, he had already left. He, he was already being absorbed by Feature. Right. Was that a normal progression? It seems like there's always, having lived in Los Angeles and met many of you and worked in the industry on myself on the feature side, when I moved to LA, it was interesting to see how, you know, there's this division, right? There's the TV guys and there's the feature guys, right? Yeah. And you were able to make that, that, that jump, but there's some, there is a barrier there, right? It seems like there's a, I don't know if there's a skill set variance or is it a cultural thing or both like what what are your thoughts on that i think it's a cultural thing to be mm -hmm. quite honest i mean when i was there at disney tv you always felt this stigma where feature was kind of like the hot shot major leagues right. and tv was the the piss poor minor leagues <laughs> where right. you didn't get any respect and you're kind right. of like oh you're just tv and you know yeah. you kind of you just you're, you're you know you're limited to this where feature, you know, they had more time, more money, and yeah, maybe the quality and the production values were just maybe a little higher, but that was only because they just had more money and more time. Right. And there, there was always that stigma. I think if you talk to anybody, you just, you, there's always that. I don't think so anymore. I mean, to be quite honest, uh, feature guys probably couldn't do what TV guys could do. Yeah. Uh, TV was an education. TV yeah. taught you how to think fast, draw fast, commit and go and you were wearing a lot of hats you know as a storyboard artist you're done you know you're doing the storyboard but you also have to make it a little tighter and you have to be more um you know you have to just throw down more you know cinematic composition staging you're planning stuff out um 
So it's quick and dirty, but I mean, you're lear- you're doing so much more. Yeah. So, and it got me ready for features. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now that sounds right. I would agree. That's kind of what I felt when I was there. I was teaching at a bunch of the studios and even just doing that, you know, and gaining friends in both spaces. It felt like it was major or minor leagues and television was faster, more hardcore and more strict yet at the same time um, where it's like, if you got to feature, it felt like you'd arrived and now you can relax and focus more on the craft right because yeah. you had like you said time and money right yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and and to some extent that's good because right. you can focus on one thing uh for tv you know again it's like you're, you're you have, there's so much more you have to consider and you have to do it fast yeah so every, it, you know it was it, and everything was almost a one shot you almost had like one or two takes to do right. it in features right you know, the time, you know, you could be working on something for months and months and months. I, I think uh, TV is valuable. I mean, yeah. it just kind of, it's always gotten kind of like this bad, uh, uh, bad rap, but I, 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 you know, in a heartbeat, I would always defend it. It's like, no, TV is, is everybody should start on TV. Yeah. I mean, look at it now too, right? I mean, television does as well if not better financially than film i mean yeah. a lot of people would argue over the 2000s and this this in the last two decades television in general has created amazing characters and amazing stories just as good as film right exactly yeah the production values have gotten even stronger in, in tv too yeah so so you and i finally met around 2004 or so i think i met you talking about comic con i started going to comic con as well now that i lived in la from new york and i originally was there peddling my first drawing book and then when i owned the school i started advertising the school there was which is when i met you and steven and a bunch of whole other a uh, bunch of other amazing and talented artists from the industry uh, which worked out because then when I had the school, I had you guys come over and teach at the school and, um, yeah. you know, and lecture at the school. And yeah, it was such a great time. It was, for me, it was super stressful, but really exciting, you know, yeah. uh, all at once. Um, so I remember one of the things that always stuck out in my mind was that you always wore a Pixar baseball cap. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, I thought, man, that's kind of cool because I do believe that the things you know, where you put your mind is where you kind of take yourself, you know? Uh And I know that was always a big interest of yours and uh, not too much longer after that, right? You ended up getting a job there. Yeah, it was uh, 2009 that I got the call. Prior to that, I was working for uh, Astro Boy, the Astro Boy movie. Right. And uh, yeah, Uh, and you know, if I can backtrack, I originally got hired at Pixar in 2004. Oh. Uh, as a story artist, because uh, I was playing as a story artist. Oh, yes. And I remember uh, I got the gig, and we were, me and my wife were all ready to kind of move up. And I remember we got a, we got a, a call right at the last minute, because we were getting ready to sell our house. We, had, we, we bought a house in Burbank, right. and uh, we were getting ready to sell it. And then we get a call saying, like, you know what? Um, we're going to have to, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't bring you up at this time. And we're like, what happened? Around about this time, Disney and Pixar were having their ugly divorce. Right. Um, and so um, part of the casualties were all new hires couldn't be brought on. So I was like, you know, I was so close. And then, you know, I realized yeah. it didn't happen. So we're like, oh, but that's okay. Because after that is when I, you know, I kept doing more design. And then I eventually went to Astro Boy, worked with a whole bunch of other great folks there. And then years later, they always, Pixar always had me uh, in mind. I remember, you know, they would, they would be so kind just to let me know, like, oh, we're still thinking of you. We're still thinking of you. And then eventually, I think they approached me and said, like, well, would you consider design work? And I think I did submit some design stuff. And then 2009 is when they said, would you be interested in coming up? Right. Yeah. And so, and then I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man, that must have been tough. I know that you wanted Pixar and then you have, it's like right in your grasp only for it to get canceled, right? Yeah, it was kind of, you know, cause you, you feel, you know, you work so hard. This is kind of like your dream job or where you want to go. Yeah. And then you're there and then all of a sudden uh, things beyond your control, you're not. And you're like, yeah. oh, what happened? So. 
Yeah, not cool. I, uh, one of my dreams is always to do boards for live action film. And uh, I'll try to make this really short, but I, 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 got call, I was living in New York at the time. I got called in to do some commercial boards for a commercial director. Um, I, it was, I remember it was a Friday night. Uh, I met the director. He ironically started giving me all these details about uh, camera lenses and the speed of the film. And, and I'd done quite a bit of boarding in New York for other commercial directors. This was really unique that he was that specific. So I roughed some stuff out. I went home for the weekend, worked on it, came into New York Sunday night to meet him at the studio and hand off these boards. And when I came in, he was looking through, he was looking on this television at, um, I think it was Jerry Maguire came on. And I was like, oh, did you work on that? He was like, oh, I was a DP on that. And then Schindler's List came on. And I'm like, did you work on that? He's like, yeah, I was the DP, the DP on that. And for those of you who don't know, DP is director of photography, right? So he's the cinematographer, basically. And I'm like, holy shit, this is... This is, is that still, Michael No, no. This is Janusz Kaminski, who's... Oh, my God, him? Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is like Spielberg's go-to cinematographer, like, for the last 20-plus years, right? And oh my gosh. I know. I was like, ugh, I hope you like <laughs> these boards. Like, can I go home and work on them more, <laughs> you know? Wow. And, and Saving Private Ryan had just come out, honestly, like, within that month. Yeah. And I was like, did you work on Saving Private Ryan? He's like, yeah, I was a DP on that, right? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I hope you like these boards, right? So I hand <laughs> off the boards to him. Friends of mine were full-timers at this one animation studio, this commercial house in New York it was called Chelsea Pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called him up and I was like, you know, did you hear anything about it? Was Janusz, you know, was he pleased with them? He's like, yeah, no, he praised you up and down. He loved the boards. And I was like, oh, thank God. At least he was happy with it. A year later, I get this phone call. I think the guy's name was Danny, if I'm not mistaken. And I was living in New Jersey and uh, I get this call and he's like, hey, um, this is Janusz Kaminski's assistant. Um, did you do boards with him on this, you know, this commercial spot? And I was like, yeah, I did. He's like, well, he really loved your boards. He wants you to storyboard for this first film. It's his directorial debut, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm in. I'm finally in. Because for those of you who don't know, it, it's hard to become a board artist in film. You either have to be on a job that's non-union that goes union or you need a director to basically sign you into the into the um into the union right yeah or grandfathered in somehow or something exactly it's very tricky it's very you know you got to be really lucky basically right right place right time right people the whole thing yeah uh so i was like oh my god i'm gonna get in i can't believe it i'm gonna start boarding for film so they send me the script i'm reading the script and i'm starting to like thumbnail out boards for the movie and I don't hear from them for like a week and a half, two weeks. And Danny calls me up again. It's like, oh, I don't know how to tell you this, but we ate up the time we wanted you to do the board work over these last couple of weeks with location scouting in New York because they weren't from New York, they're from LA. So they spent all that time running around New York instead. And he's like, we don't even have time to do the boards. We're basically just going to shoot, right? And so it came, it was like right in my hand and it uh, left as fast as it came. <laughs> Uh, so frustrating. You know, he invited us to the set. So I, I went to the shoot and stuff for the film. I think it was Stigmata is the name of the movie, which you could find on like, you know, Amazon. Oh, yeah. I remember Stigmata. Yeah. Yeah. So that was him. And I should have been the board artist on that. Oh, man. But, Did he ever call uh, you back for it for like another no. show? No. So after I was in New York, that was around the late 90s. I moved to California when I met you. And I started thinking about boards again. This is even prior to the school, because it was about two years I was in LA before I started the school. And I thought, you know, maybe I should try to go for boarding again. And I found his agency. I think it was at CCA, which is like the really big one in Los Angeles, right? And uh, I found out who his agent was. And I sent him my reportage book, because it was done in a style that was very similar to how I did the boards for him. And uh, I sent it to his agent. And I actually got a call from the agent saying, um, you know, this is, this is really great. We love the book. I'll make sure that Janusz gets this, but he's like in Europe somewhere shooting with Steven on another film right now. And, you know, I don't know when he'll get back to you. I can't make any promises. And I basically just never heard from him. And then I didn't push it, which normally I would, but then I had the school, right? So then I was like, you know, boom, the whole storyboarding idea just like totally left my head. Plus I was pitching in LA, a lot of different show ideas at the time. So like storyboarding was the last thing on my mind, you know, and yeah. that was it. And that kind of was the end of that, that pipeline. Ironically, you know, here we are 2020 
not that long ago, uh, one of my friends who's a film director, he's done animation and live action. He's been pitching and all of a sudden I was helping him out with boards again. So I love it. Like I love storyboarding. I love film. Um, I just, and I thought, oh, here's another opportunity, right? Like this film gets picked up. I might actually get into the union. Yeah. Um, but this was two years ago. He's still doing, you know, he's pitching other ideas and he just got picked up by Netflix for something else. Okay, but cool. um, that one idea that I helped him on, that's still going back in like revisions and it's part of the whole, um, uh, what's it, uh, Fox purchase of from Disney, right? Like yeah. it's, it's floating in that space, right? So yeah. it's kind of what you said before, you never know, there's bigger powers than us at hand at times, right? With mergers and separations of companies and layoffs and who gets hired, who gets the new CEO position, who doesn't and so on yeah. and so on that sometimes can dramatically affect your career, you know? Yeah, it could stall things or you, 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 they stay in limbo for, yep. for indefinitely and you're like, well, what's gonna happen to it? You don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, close, man. but yet so far. <laughs> that's great, I mean, that's yeah. an awesome story. Like, gosh, right. is that Giannis, I mean, gosh, he's like, he's big time. Oh yeah, he's big time. He's one of the world's most prolific cinematographers, right? I mean, uh -huh. you mentioned any Spielberg movie, after maybe like Jaws and Peter Pan, and it's pretty much Janusz Kaminski that shot it, you know? Yeah. So anyway, enough about me. I just thought it was an interesting no, that's story great. of being great. so great. close, you know? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So let's take a look at some of your other, um, your other Pixar work here, right? So you get into Pixar, right? You, you didn't make it and then you made it. Yeah, I made it. Yeah, so 2009 is when I started. My first movie was Cars 2. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think I learned what movie it was, I think, just uh, three weeks prior to moving up. Mm -hmm. Two weeks prior, yeah. So it took you out of Los Angeles to San Francisco. How was that? It was good. You know, uh, it was, uh, you know, I had, I really didn't know San Francisco at all. I mean, I, I visited when I was a kid, when I was like nine or eight, but I didn't really remember what it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving up here, um, it was a small adjustment, but I loved it. I, yeah. it's, just, it's a, for me being an LA guy and moving to here where we were, which is the, uh, we were, we're not in San Francisco. We're kind of in a valley east of San Francisco. We're on the other side of the hills of Oakland. Right. So uh, it's kind of, it's, um, it feels, where we live, it feels a lot more like we're in Santa Clarita. Right. right. So it's a lot more slower. Mm -hmm. um, it's a slower paced, so we like it. Right. So this is obviously for Coco, right? For Coco, yeah, early skull uh, explorations. So these aren't really um, specific characters so much as this kind of like us kind of taking stabs of generic characters. Right. Yeah, yeah just cool. figure out lineups and like just shapes and, um, you know, do they have facial hair, do they don't? And, you know, do they have eye sockets, eyebrows? And, um, yeah. So iteration, right? Like just pumping out a lot of different work and just exploring, right? Pretty much, yeah. Because we didn't really know the rules. We only had we had like maybe five. I remember five things they told us. Uh, they they're not supposed to be scary because it was supposed to be a movie that was about family. Right. Uh, we have to figure out um, both male and female, young and old. Uh, we also had to figure out if they had facial hair or if they wore clothes. Uh, we also had to f make them emote, make them expressive. So we had to like figure out like, how do we do that? Eyebrows, you know, um, you know, do, do we make things rubbery or, you know, we had to figure that out. Right. And then the last thing was it had to be original. Uh, prior to us working on it, the corpse bride had come out and so right. did the book of life. Right. Was, uh, and, and night before Christmas. I mean, these are just really beautiful, iconic movies. And we're like, we, can't do any of that we have to figure out how to do a skeleton in an original way i see so it was that was the challenge and we're just i remember we just you know we pretty much just took stabs at it figured it out we had a great crew yeah we got some monsters inc here yeah after after cars was monsters uh university uh that was great i got to work with uh, uh harley jessup uh he was our pd Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, worked with uh, Dai Sumi and uh, Robert Kondo. Those guys are great. Yeah. Uh, 
So this is very different. I, I remember I had lunch with you um, while you were at Pixar and you're telling me you're doing these flats. And I was like, wow, how's that going? Like, I know John is the loose pencil guy and here you've got these like really tight designs, right? Yeah, it was, I mean, these were just uh, elevation sketches based on earlier concepts, but yeah, we were doing a lot more of this and that was okay. I mean, it's needed. It's part of the gig, but it was just, uh, it was just something I was trying to struggle with at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what happened to Pixar, right? Yeah, so I was there after after Monsters University. I did a little bit of uh, I did one, I did Coco, and then I did a little bit of stuff for Inside Out, mm -hmm. and and I remember I was I was I was on Finding Dory for like maybe a month, right? But I really didn't do anything there, and then I was let go. Yeah, um, I at the time Pixar, um, I think they were in this. They they had to really. They were in this. They were in this situation where I think they had to lay people off because I think the parent company Disney. Um, I don't know specifically, but I think they were. They had to take some layoffs because some movies had underperformed uh, prior to. Um, at, at this point, Brave had come out, but prior to Brave, I mean, I'm sorry, Monster University had come out, but prior to Monster University, there was Brave. Brave was an expensive movie. Mm -hmm. uh, they had changed directors midway. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that was The Good Dinosaur, which is also yep. an expensive movie. They kind of did that. They took a long time for that. They had to re-release it. And that's an expensive deal. Basically, a lot of these business decisions kind of put Pixar in a position where they couldn't justify keeping so many bodies onto the studio that didn't have enough places for them to go to. Yeah. So I remember, I think the parent company was going to, lay off a lot of folks but i think pixar cut their cut their own foot off right. to try and save from laying off more people than right. needed right. so they laid off uh, 55 people uh system-wide you know from different areas in the studio they laid off five from the art department and i was one of them yeah and nice. um yeah and it was tough i was i remember i was like uh it was tough for me because i actually thought i was going to retire uh, at Pixar. At Pixar, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I, it, it just, it kind of really screwed with you because you're kind of figuring out like, well, what happened? I, you know, uh, this was supposed to be, this was, this wasn't in the plan. Yeah. This is so, my life, right? I was going to be here till, I, like you said, till I retire, right? Yeah. You're kind of like, you know, and I've been, I've been, I've been fired before, but this feels like, you know, you kind of let somebody down or right. you didn't feel like you got, you got the love you were hoping to get. I don't know. Right. That was just my weird way of thinking it. So yeah, at this point, we were uh, me and my wife were deciding like, well, do we stay in San Francisco or do we go back to LA? Right. So the original plan was to like go back to LA, but at this point, I wasn't unsure. So I remember I spoke to Pascal Campion mm -hmm. and Steve Silver, um, really good friends of mine who I respect right. a lot. Right. And they had already they were already working remotely from home and they were kind of, you know, doing this already. So they encouraged me like, you know, it can be done. Why don't you just stay and try it out? So I did. And, uh, this was like February of 2014 that mm -hmm. I started doing this. And, uh, the first gig I worked on was Angry Birds movie and right. I loved Angry Birds movie, but the first nine months were hard for me because I don't know time management. <laughs> and, and, working for, and working from home is, is tough if you don't know how to do it you had producer so, always whipping you before right <laughs> yeah exactly i mean we had production managers who actually you know they they were the ones who managed the time and the schedules right. so they they would just tell you when something was done and you just had to do it but on all, all, now all of this fell on me and i didn't know how to do it and so it was very frustrating um i uh, it, at times it was chaotic and i yeah. just uh, a lot of times I didn't know what I was doing, Yeah. but you know, I kept at it, kept at it. And after nine months, it got easier and it got to the point where I really enjoyed it because I realized if you know, if you can better kind of schedule the time and work with them, what you have to, it gave me more time to be with my family. It gave me more time to do personal projects. It gave me more time to travel. Yeah. I started teaching at this time. Right. Um, I, I started loving it. And plus, I realized 
the one thing I missed was working with people, uh, working with the team. The one thing I did miss was actually working at a studio because I wasn't there dealing with all the politics or anything else. It, for now, it was just me and the work. Right. And that, it, that, that's what I love. You know, so it just yeah. meant like, you know, for me to socialize with my friends, I would just hang out with them or, you know, we'd do something on the weekends. Right. But, uh, and that's one thing I miss, but yeah, I, I found new stuff that I, that really made things a lot more happier for me. So that, I guess that led, like you said, to some, the teaching. So all the way back from when you were, you know, working at Entertainment Art Academy and then you're in these studios, now you're home. And then you got out and started teaching, which is actually when I guess we bumped into each other in uh, in Florence, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, yeah. When we met in Florence, it was actually a family. Uh, it was a family. Uh, we were we were planning a trip. We were going to be in Florence for the summer. Right. So we had saved enough money. We found an Airbnb that we loved. Um, we. It was it was an Airbnb that could host like I think at least fifteen people. So we had a lot of family and friends and cousins stay with us, and that's where I met you. And then right. I got to know these uh, my beautiful friends from the Nemo Academy, right. like Luca, Francesco, right. uh, and Carlo, and, and everybody there. They have the uh, the Nemo Academy, and uh, I had I had known them from years before because I would kind of help them. Um, uh, we, we met at, at CTN and so forth, and they had brought me up for a previous workshop. And then they would have this summer um, um, workshop where they would do like a short film. So I was there helping them out when I could. Uh, so it was it was a little bit of pleasure and a little bit of helping out the school, but it was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, it I mean, it's just so funny because I live in the Bay Area as well, and we're probably about, uh, I don't know, my guess would be probably about an hour drive away from one another but yeah. here we are in <laughs> Florence having a late lunch together oh yeah and that was awesome that was so cool yeah because I remember we met and we had this awesome lunch and yeah we did you know we had <laughs> wine and beer and here we are in this beautiful place together and that, yeah. I remember it was yeah. awesome yeah it was great I've been teaching in Florence for the last six years now um, at a school called The Sign. So it's funny that you were at Nemo, which is the other big sort of entertainment school in Florence, you know, so we're both in Florence teaching. And I don't, I, you know, I think you've been going there a couple of years now too, but I, I love it. Florence to me is almost my like second home. I've been there so often that I, I know my restaurants, I know the streets, you know, just, exactly. I just love going. Yeah, it's funny. You see, I, it's so funny you say that because me and my wife are saying like that it's our kind of like our second home. Yeah. And we've gotten to know all the landmarks. It's like, we know yeah. where everything's at now. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of cool. <laughs> so you went, like you said, you were working on the Angry Birds film. And um, after Pixar, I know of late, your latest film is Scooby, right? Which just came out. Yeah, that was, uh, I was with Scooby for like almost two years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just got, it just came out recently. And I loved it. I was working with Michael Karinsky, who's awesome. And uh, I was doing set designs. I was doing a little bit of story moments, but it was predominantly set designs. We had a great crew and I had so much fun. It was just a great time. I embarrassingly have to say, I haven't seen it yet, but I teach quite a few people. And I always ask them like, you know, what do you think of the new movies? And quite a few of them have come back with really positive accolades on Scooby talking about, um, how it's a uh, an origin story and how the characters were handled and you know and so on so yeah it was hear. great um yeah i mean this the story was awesome it was it was just a fun it was typical scooby you know it had that fun kind of romp and you know i, and, I was happy it wasn't another live action film <laughs> you know <too>. scooby <laughs> me too i mean i i mean i i think after the live action uh, there was other scooby formations that i it kind of like oh i don't want to see it but I, yeah. I know that here they made a great effort it's like no they want to bring back the original scooby feeling and theme but all cgi and uh yeah i think they did a good job so you had to make you know just to go back you had to make this um transition from working traditionally to digitally right when did that happen why did that happen and what do you think about it i remember the reason why well, i remember the production of when things were changing um when i started doing tinkerbell when i joined tinkerbell 
Tinkerbell was supposed to be a 2D movie, mm -hmm. uh, direct-to-video movie. And all of a sudden, midway, right when Disney had absorbed, uh, I mean, Pixar had, or when I say that, John Lasser had absorbed pretty much control of the Disney studios, John was coming on more. I remember at that time, they started saying like, "We're gonna, okay, Tinkerbell's gonna be a CG movie. So all of a sudden, mm. our designs had to now shift over to like, we have to take into consideration more modeling, more, we had to do elevation sketches. We had to do a lot more stuff in the design to help kind of facilitate the modeling part. I see. So for, at that point, I, there was some classes on the side. I think the union, the animation union, um, they had a, uh, a the, they had a collaboration with a, a, a kind of like a trade school where they taught um, like modeling and Photoshop classes, the studio arts. Uh, it's right next to Dodger Stadium. And I remember I took a Photoshop class there and then I eventually took a Maya class there. And those classes were for me so invaluable because it was my first step into learning Photoshop right. and uh, learning Maya. And then eventually, um, you know, I would do a lot more on the job. I remember when I worked on Astro Boy is when I really started learning more Maya and Photoshop. Um, mm -hmm. in, in Astro Boy, you know, Sam Mitchlap, who's awesome, and Jake Rowell, yeah. um, he's, uh, our, they're PD and art director, but they worked together kind of to, 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 uh, to see the vision of the film. Right. They encouraged us to, they were gonna bring the art team in, they were gonna do a 2D, 3D hybrid system where they wanted the artists to have the tools to not only sketch, but to build these rough footprints or these rough models of what we're designing. So we would like sketch it, and then we would, in Maya, rough, rough it out. We would take a JPEG, and then we go back and finish the design. Right. So not only do we have a piece of finished art, but we also had a, a dirty footprint or, or just a really rough block that we can also hand in. And I remember, um, at first it was tough because I hated Maya, <laughs> right. uh, but then again, just kind of like the light bulb, it was like, oh, I get it, I love it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember that was just, um, bec because of, the, of the, the need for it and also the encouragement from the team, uh, I mean, these tools helped out a lot. And then those tools actually helped me out when I went on cars, when I went to Pixar to do cars, because right. I remember, um, we had to do these big cities for cars. Me and Armand Baltazar, one of my, one of my good friends, uh, awesome artist, great, phenomenal artist. Yeah. We were designing Porta Corsa, uh, the Italian fictional city. And I remember we had to do that in a few weeks. And I'm thinking like, how are we gonna do this? And I remember we, most of it was done in Maya, where you know we would sketch stuff out and we would kind of block it up. And me and Armand, you know, we used Maya to kind of, you know, I would like do the design part. Armand would facilitate kind of designing all the whole, you know, he was like a city planner. He was just laying stuff out. Right. And um, it's cool. Yeah. And that, and we, you know, Maya was helped us in that. Yeah. It's awesome. Before we close out and go to the demoing, which I can't wait for, I have just one other question, which is, um, you know, any suggestions for new artists, right? Like, trying to get in nowadays you find it's different than when you and i tried to get in um and you know is it do you have to go to school is always a big question you feel like school is still a requirement to get into the studios is it purely just your book as you called it earlier you yeah. know, what are your thoughts on that i think i think yeah it's definitely a book you have a strong book that just showcases what you can do what you can bring your skill sets um it's funny, people tell me, it's like, what's a good school to go to? There's some good schools out there. Right. Um, you know, you always hear uh, Art Center and Cal Arts are great schools. Uh, right. Other good schools I recommend are like uh, San Jose State is mm -hmm. a great school. Yep. There's, and there's a few others, like I think uh, uh, SCAD is a good school. There's some great uh, artists coming out of there. Yep. There's some coming out of, I think there was a one in Columbia. Gosh, I don't remember exactly the name, but... Uh, you know, some have some are strong as far as like story. Some are strong in design. Right. Um, it's hard to say because it's like what's great is like there's so many great awesome. talent coming from different areas. Right. Um, and then along with that, there's a lot of great online schools. 
that are really, you know, they're, they're there that, that kind of give more resources as far as what people can do. A lot more yeah. than what we had. That, that's yeah. why I know. When we were starting, or when I started back in the late 90s, they really wasn't that many online schools or, or secondary schools like that. No, not at all. Now. Yeah, no, not. I mean, I remember in Entertainment Art Academy, I was, um, I was using WebEx and try, you know, having you guys come in and do these workshops on the weekends. And it was the very beginning of like broadcasting yeah. through the internet, live streaming, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was, exp I remember, you know, I remember it cost me a thousand dollars a month to use WebEx. And now, oh gosh. you know, we're on Zoom. And if you're just doing a one on one meeting, it's free, right? And it's, it's like yeah. $15 or $20 a month. I was paying a thousand dollars a month to, Oh my offer that same thing yeah it was yeah. really really pricey so so uh, i know you're okay with talking and drawing right yeah <laughs> so yeah remember. definitely <laughs> so i i don't really know what i'm gonna draw yet so i'm just gonna like just kind of rub things out and just kind of yeah i'll just pick your brain while you're so do you have certain a question i always get of course is you know do you have certain brushes you go to is this photoshop brush or you know do you have some special go-to that you're using not really. There's a few brushes I, I like. I mean, the ones, the standard brushes I like are kind of like, a, well, the basic round. Yeah. What I do is I do a round and then I kind of like will kind of do a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I play with the transfer. I put it on pen pressure and then I kind of do something like that. So now I kind of have, after I do that, the opacity, I probably put like about 80 or 70. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just have this kind of looseness. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of use that to paint. Oh, interesting. I kind of layer it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So that's your go-to for painting, huh? Yeah, usually. Usually. Another that's painting cool. I do is, um, uh, you know, Cheyenne has these great brushes. Right. So, you know, I, I, I like those. Uh-huh. Um, that's cool. I change the opacity a little bit. And then uh, I, uh, I remember uh, Robert Kondo has these great brushes uh that i uh that that i used for monsters university see if i can find him but he's got these really um awesome brush that is phenomenal Let's see if i can get a new layer to give you an idea oh yeah mm -hmm. so it kind of works with um it it, it kind of goes in and then with pressure you can kind of create more mm -hmm. but yeah it's cool so, so not you're not like a connoisseur of brushes there's a few things that you know you go to and you use them and you got your little changes on them but i guess what i'm getting at here is it really comes down to the skill in the end right it's not the brush per se versus you just sitting here and being able to draw and how fast you work uh i guess so yeah you know it's funny because early on when i was doing like traditional stuff i was being like oh what's the pencil you're using it's all right. about the pencil Right. And after a while, you realize it's not necessarily about the pencil. It's more like what you what you're pretty much are are, are doing, uh, right. you know, with the with with the pencil. Yeah, one of you know one of the things I come across in teaching is somebody will see what you're doing right now, and they'll think, "Oh, that's how." people draw <laughs> and they do like here you are you're doing it but what they don't recognize is oh john knows perspective and form and fluidity and force and anatomy and facial anatomy and facial expressions and right like all of the skills it's taken over time for you to draw this uh, more immediately and this quickly right uh -huh. yeah it's kind of for me, I mean, I really, most of the time, I just don't really know what I, what I draw. I usually start with the head. Right. And after that, I kind of like, okay, just kind of, I just use these big shapes. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I'm really pressing this, 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 uh, this really strong diagonal, uh, the axis of where the shoulders are. I'll probably throw that down here. And I'm just kind of blocking things out rough, you know, mm -hmm. with big shapes, trying to keep things gestural, trying to play with overlap, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but look, right, you mentioned already four or five different skills that are all drawing skills just in the act of doing one little sketch. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, right? yeah, you know, just kind of, you know, just just trying to, just kind of trying to just keep a simple design yeah. where, you know, where it could be. Um, I mean, a lot of this is kind of like, I'm just throwing it down and knowing, because I, I don't know, I'm just kind of like, 
feeling it out and feel like what it could be. Do you find that when you're drawing, um, you know, you're working all the time in these different studios, do you doodle a lot for yourself or do you really only draw to, to work? And if you do doodle for yourself and just draw on the side, um, is it with a theme or a focus in mind or you just kind of go off and let your brain go wherever it wants to go? Uh, kind of both, you know, a lot of times, you know, for work, I, you know, I work one way for work, but then I draw to relax too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I kind of just fart around with, with when I'm, when I'm drawing, you know, I just kind of, I like to just, it's, I call it like telephone drawing where, you know, you don't really think about it, you know, right. I just kind of just let it happen. Right. And then a lot of times it's, you get these really nice accidents like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. and you don't think about it too much, mm -hmm. but, um, but you know, when I want to do my own stuff, I would just kind of like, um, just kind of let, let, you know, just let it go. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes I'll have something in mind, but then I know I always change as I, as I, as I let it happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of, so for those of you who don't know, John does have a, there's a product on, on drawingforce.com, which is you, when you worked with me at, um, entertainment art Academy of you talking about, um, just visual development, right? And all the different aspects of it. Uh, one of my favorite parts in that is, uh, you know, you were talking about uh, staging, right? And knowing like foreground, middle ground, background, and almost th seeing things as uh, almost a theater set, if I dare say, right? Yeah, it's like uh, um, kind of, you know, as far as thinking in space, I kind of was like, okay, oops, sorry. Get a new layer going. I was thinking like, if you kind of like, are looking down at a stage and right. say, here's the movie camera, you know, on, a, on one of these tripods and so forth. Mm -hmm. So usually you have your actor on a stage, mm -hmm. but usually, you know, there's a simple backdrop, but it's like, okay, so if you were to look at this, it's very flat, you know, if you were to look at through the, through the camera, what you want to do is like, you want to create some kind of depth. Um, you want to create something a little more, visually interesting. So you want to consider something in the foreground, something near the midground where your characters might be. And then this is your backdrop, say something here, which is a BG. And then you go the extra layer. So what's behind the BG? Maybe there's an extra layer of information. Maybe there's a third layer. So right away, you know how things that are overlapping, which can apply depth and space going backwards. Right. You know, but all the while you want to maintain that your focal point is clear and that it's kind of the center of interest and that things, you know, depending on how you design it, excuse me, you can compose where you're using maybe shapes or negative space to frame where your focal point is. You can even apply other things like things are indirectly guiding the eye to your focal point. You can suggest maybe um, using values, you know, lights and darks, where maybe negative space, lights and darks, he pops out a little more. Mm -hmm. You know, this maybe it could be dark too, but you know, you're you're just kind of commanding those elements to kind of, you know, guide the eye to what is important because there's going to be a lot of stuff in the frame. Right. You know, there's going to be a lot of information. But you want to always kind of control what you see first, because throughout all this, there's a story happening. So, you know, everything should kind of support or drop off, and this should be commanding. You know, it's it's a hierarchy of what you see. Right. Yeah, at Disney, I remember one of the big epiphanies. I used to hang out with the layout guys a lot. I just loved their skill level in drawing. Uh -huh. And uh, they always would say, um, you know, they would always like point, right? If you look at any Disney film, you'd be amazed at how much pointing is going on in those movies, uh -huh. right? Yeah, it's, it's always true. something. Yeah, always something pointing to where the you know where the character is. Yeah, there's always something kind of leading the eye there, right? Just to help kind of like you know underscore like, look at me, here it is. Yeah, exactly. Look at me. Or the, another way of looking at it would be if you were a background designer, you can almost tell where the character is supposed to show up. It is the stage. It's like, ah, they're supposed to show up right here. Everything's pointing here. The spotlight's here. This is where they're going to they're gonna stand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's almost, it's just, uh, you know, great staging to kind of imply, you know, 
like <laughs> performance and just kind of what things can, where you're going to look at. So you're just going to kind of. One of the things also that really stood out for me when we were at Entertainment Art Academy was the idea of you have your own like mannequin, right? You know what like a generic John Navarre's figure looks like for you to board with, right? And then you can make that person taller and thinner and shape them however you want, but you've got that and you're kind of doing that with the faces, right? Like right now, you're going right away for the eyes and the eyebrows, right? Just even getting some ellipses down there and saying, let me get expression, right? Uh -huh. Does that sound right or do you, am I off course with- Oh no, you're, you're right. You know, I'm just kind of like getting ellipses. I kind of just work with basic shapes. You know, I always start with the circle mm -hmm. and I kind of always put an eye line mm -hmm. and then I just kind of drop the eye, layer, I, the eye line there. And then I kind of like, okay, where am I looking at? And mm -hmm. Where things are and then I just usually kind of put landmarks as far as what that is mm -hmm. and then I start essentially I start kind of sketching out roughly you know what's going to be the shape of the face and so forth and then from there I'm kind of like okay is the neck going to be directly underneath right is it going to be where he's going to be you know the head's in front of the body right uh maybe it's more like leaning toward one side so maybe we're going to kind of have that kind of thing going on um yeah so I guess over time we all have our like fast habits, right? Things that just work for us. Yeah, it's my go-to actually, yeah. Do you prefer, if you were, if you had a choice, I guess, right? It's like, do you prefer doing what you're doing right now or do you prefer going into more finished work and painting? I kind of prefer this. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I started as a board guy and I, I just like the immediacy of it. Plus I get bored easily. Yeah. So I know if I work too long on something, I tend to kill it because I'll overwork it. And I just kind of, it things kind of look too forced in there. Like I'm just adding stuff just to add stuff. Right. So I kind of just like, I, I, I've always liked things that are just rough and immediate, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not necessarily finished, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, that's just me. What's funny is that I've actually, I've been lucky enough that when I get hired, they always, like to just use me as the guy who just like just do just do value sketches or value paintings mm -hmm. and you know they always tell me it's like work like your sketches work like your your rough compositions yeah, and, awesome. and 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 i guess that's because i think they like i guess the energy that i bring in or that things are just kind of loosely suggested without right. being uh, overly uh, tied down yeah it lets your imagination work in there a little bit right exactly yeah and what's great is like, you know, they'll, they'll hire a painter to kind of clean up or, or, or paint or color out whatever I finish, which is great. So. Yeah, that's awesome. You find you usually like putting characters more in scenes or just literally just draw figures? Uh, I like them drawing in scenes. Um, uh, you know, I always, because I'm used to that for work. So it's like, okay, when I design a set, I always have to like add the character in it. So I have some kind of context of space and scale. Right. And also, you know, it's like, how big is the door? Um, you know, what's the context of the building? You know, I always have to like consider the context and then I have to figure out like, okay, what's the emotion of, this, of, the, of the beat that I'm going in? Well, and when I say emotion, it's kind of like, okay, I can draw a house, but I have to figure out like, okay, it's just a simple house, but I have to figure out like, well, is it a scary house? Right. Is this a safe house? You know, what's scary about it? So if it's scary about it, then I can like compose or design. Well, what's scary? Is it because it's not an upkept house and that uh, things are falling apart? There's weeds or something. Right. You know, if there's a sag uh, and so forth. Is it the lighting where I stage it so that there's always a shadow growing over it? So that's always in, in darkness, you know? Um, I don't know, you know, I have to figure out the emotion because, you know, I, I'm a designer, but part of the design is you have to design for a context for the story. And the story is always like emotional. What do you think the difference is, be, you know, between saying I'm a drawer or I'm a designer? Mm, I don't know. I mean, for a designer, I think you have to think more about the meanings behind what you're drawing. 
Mm -hmm. You know, there's a meaning behind the drawing, but the but the, the, the drawing. Okay, how can I say this? Uh, you have to think about the meaning of the design because the design is fulfilling the needs of the story. Right. So you know, when you're designing something, it's like okay, there's a script, or even if there's not a script, there's a story, or there's an idea there that you have to that the director wants in the movie. You know, so your your job is to kind of figure out what that is. But then, you know, like I said, it's like you can draw a house or a car, but you have to figure out like, okay, well, who's in this house? Uh, who lives in this house? Uh, why is it important? Is there something in that room or in that house uh, that is meaningful to, to a character or to the story? Yeah. You know? I know it's always this tough question, right? Like I, I've taught classes on character design mm -hmm. and I kind of describe it as, you know, the difference is you're not, drawing could be sketching, of course, but when you're designing, like you said, there's a very purposeful uh, focus, you know, with opinion that you're after. You can almost say even a caricature, right? could be a character design. Yeah. You could be figure drawing, but if you're figure drawing with an intent of going beyond a study, right? Then in a sense, you are starting to design, right? But I think it's like purpose driven to your point. Sounds like it's the same thing you're saying here. It's like, there's some other idea, right? And you're, you're illustrating, illustrating, drawing, painting, whatever you're doing, but you're going towards a goal. That means there's some intent there that makes it turn into design, right? There, there is. Yeah. I mean, there's some kind of meaning there. Um, yeah. It just, there should be, it, it should be like, it's like, okay. It, yeah. It's, every drawing should be kind of cool and pretty. Mm -hmm. But it's like, but there's a meaning behind it. And then behind the choices that you make, there's a little more information there that we can pull in. Like, oh, okay, uh, there's history there. It's like, you know, what's that person wearing? Oh, he's wearing that because maybe his social status or maybe because that's his favorite team or that's, you know, what, he, what he's wearing is important to his character. Right. Yeah. It's choices, right? Like, I guess we design our own characters, meaning our own being based on what we wear, where we live, the house we live in, what our living room or bedroom looks like, the car we drive, right? They're all part of design. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So. That's cool. So in closing here, while you're sketching, um, any last words of advice potentially for our audience uh, when it comes to, I don't know, work ethic or, you know, you, you've been in a, you know, you've been in this very unique position of being in studios and outside of studios, some of the best studios, um, working satellite, um, you know, freelancing. Uh, you've kind of covered the gambit when it comes to work experience. Uh, yeah, what, what's that been like? Any thoughts on how to handle that or how people could make choices around maybe what, which one might be the best for them? Like, how do you decide that? You can actually, um, let's see if I can close that. Maybe I can do this. I will, I guess this could be it. Yeah. So basically what I was going to share with folks is that I want them to like, you know, I always going to say like, you know, um, when I look at portfolios, I always see people, they do like a nice one piece where it's usually a little guy and a big guy, or there's some moment, but they're kind of like they're having a standoff. Right. So I was just going to encourage people like, okay, pretend you're a cinematographer in this moment and then move the camera around mm -hmm. and then showcase different points of view, POVs and perspectives, maybe, you know, over the shoulder uh, shots where you have over the shoulder monster looking down at the hero. So that way you're playing the hero more vulnerable. You're playing up the scale and then vice versa, do a reverse shot. So that way, you know, your hero's in the foreground. And again, your hero is so, you, the building is so big, it's filling screen. Right. Maybe you get poetic and you play with reflection. Uh, and images to kind of tell the same thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe you get some high um, images of close-ups to really play up what the character's thinking or feeling. Uh, maybe you can use composition. And here you can have an, it's an over the shoulder, but in this case, I'm framing someone within this closed set. Right. So it kind of implies metaphorically that the person is closed off, you know, nowhere to go. Uh, you can have points of action, because all this time, this has all just been a standoff. It's right. like introduce action, you know, things that are happening. Uh, introduce the chase. Uh, introduce high moments of action. You know, you can really kind of, you know, 
amplify the intensity with drama here with lighting or something happening with lighting maybe and then you know other poses to show victory um you know hero on top hero close maybe you reverse it so that way you don't necessarily see the hero but then you see the villain down blood dribbling you know what you know what's happening <laughs> yeah you definitely know uh yeah and then i was also going to suggest this and it's like and i risk and i and uh this is not too long to go this is like maybe five images but it's like okay think of the bigger story what if it's just a village like in burke like uh, how to train your dragon where you know you see huts there's people farming you know beautiful skies like they're very agrarian they're farmers mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden something happens so and i did this intentionally rough because it wasn't me focusing on pretty pictures just yet i was just focusing on ideas and right. thumbnails so say a dragon comes and hauls off the cow the beloved cow of the of the village <laughs> right. and so and here's the there's the cow's owner and he's looking on but you know houses are on fire and all of a sudden now the owner has a want or a need he, he needs he, he wants to save uh, his cow so now you start a journey so now here's the village and so right away we're entering geography and that he's now leaving he's now entering high geography things are on the way to showcase that he could be in danger or things are not as safe because right away we have contrast we have this versus mm -hmm. i'm sorry we have this versus uh how we started nice simple you know pastoral and all of a sudden things are dangerous angular unsure and then maybe until we get to this moment so all of a sudden just in images, you can apply progression, a journey. Um, you know, a journey can be emotional, psychological, something. But you're kind of like, you're creating snapshots. Yeah, it's cool. So, uh, well, something out of the norm, right? Like, more, it, it, what's interesting is you, you actually used a very common template, right? Of sort of the beginning, middle, end, right? Yeah. And, you know, we start in the house and the hometown. We end up going through the journey. It's because the dragon stole the cow. The hero goes out to find the dragon, fights uh, the dragon, slays the dragon, right? So yeah. some guys don't even know that, right? Like, it's like, first know your main story structures, right? Like, what is a yeah. story, right? Um, and then being able, to your point, play with the camera to better present um, emotional ideas, right? Yeah. Um, it's very much like, you know, when you tell the story verbally, yeah. you, you kind of like, you know, cause you kind of say like, Hey, you invite your friends over and say, Hey, guess what happened to me? And all of a sudden you're, you're, you have to give two things. You have to give information and then you have to give the emotion, how you tell the story because you're trying to amplify how you're feeling or what, or what's happening. So that's what you do verbally. So then you, but when you do that visually, you're not there to explain it. So you have to use these tools like composition and lighting and performance and you know all these three together kind of help amplify what you're trying to say so you know basically the information is pretty much uh, if i can go all the way to the beginning the information for that village it's like okay we're near the coast uh we get huts you know there's the information of sheep and who these people are. So we're, we're, we're kind of suggesting stuff here. Right. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden something happens. And right. usually that's simple story structure. That something happens, something happens to the hero that changes that hero's world, either for good or for bad. A right. good thing would be like he's at a party and then he sees a beautiful woman who he doesn't know. So all of a sudden it's like, wow, who is she? Right. So now the whole story is he needs to know who that is and you know, because he's in love, and then a further expansion of that story is: Do they get together? Do they make love last? You know, mm -hmm. something bad could be like the plague has hit, you know, my hometown, and I got to survive the plague. Right. Or there's a killer on the loose, and we got to find the killer. You know, that kind of thing. So it's something the, the inciting incident, right? Exactly. Yeah. Something changes. Something. Something. Something happens that changes the person's world, and then there's a want or a need established based on that, what that is. And that's pretty much is the, is the beginning of the story, the journey. Mm -hmm. And then it, it should all escalate, you know, everything 
There should be like, there's a thing called progressive complications. Those are just things that are standing in the way of the hero that makes it harder for him or her to get what they want. Right. And, uh, cool. you know, and it can, be, it can be as epic as this or simple as this, or it could be like the cookie. You know, like, oh, I'm hungry. I want a cookie. So <laughs> then, uh, the, the one is, I'm hungry. I want a cookie. So it's like, okay, the, the whole story is, do I get a cookie? What's in my way? Oh, there's no cookies in the house. Or, well, there, there's a store down the street, but I'm scared of dogs, and there's a big dog roaming loose in the yard. Right. You know? Right. So, uh, you know, all of these basic things are there. And the whole idea is, do I get my cookie? Right. <laughs> do we get to the goal or not? Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, I, guess, I guess, in a nutshell, having people think about story or introduce a story where you can add some progression into into things and have things that you, you know you're just you're juxtaposing these drawings which are just images or snapshots of something happening so you're kind of guiding you're you're kind of you're kind of guiding a narrative you're kind of saying like oh this happens and then this happens and then this happens so that is your you know these are first steps into storytelling there are first steps into into telling a story with with a narrative and, but they're also first stabs at like, as a designer, like what are you gonna put in your picture to showcase what we're, where we're going? So that means you have to think about the information you put in and then how you say it. Yeah, you know, you know, I was just thinking about looking at these and watching you draw earlier and how fast you work. Um, it makes me think about your drawing towards an idea, not the drawing, right? Yeah. Does that sound right? It, it's right, yeah. I mean, it, it comes back from storyboard. It's like I'm not, I'm not tied. I'm not my 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 first concern is just throwing an idea down, yeah. And it could be loose, but I know it's it's just an idea that I know I can I can fine tune, right? I'm uh, I'm not even into making it pretty. That's like way late in the game. Right now, you know, pretty pictures are fine, but if they don't say anything underneath, I don't care. Yeah. But in this medium that we work in for, for animation, everything is, is, is driven by story. So as a designer in animation, you should know story. Right. So that way you should know how to draw for animation. You should know how to draw for film, which is like, you know, you're creating images that say something. Yeah, I would say anyone in the entertainment industry that is story driven, doesn't matter if you're a prop designer, character designer, storyboard artist, and so on everyone needs to know story to some degree, right? Because every piece of art is feeding story. Exactly. I mean, you don't have to go to film school. I, you know, it's like some people say like, oh, I got to go back to school. No, right. you should just kind of know basic story structure. But everything you see, um, there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's a setup. And then there's a course of, of things happening that lead you somewhere. Right. And um, it could be a scene in a movie. And I tell people, look at scenes in a movie. Don't look at, I mean, I tell people, it's, it's great if you can see movies, but a lot of people don't have time to look at movies. But look at scenes in a movie, because these scenes are mini movies within the movie. Right. And then each mini movie has, um, has a setup. There's a beginning, and there's also an inciting incident. Yeah. And then there's a grade of information there that the director wanted you to, to, to show. There's either a revelation, a discovery, there is a, a new character arc or, or something happening, uh, a, a morsel of, of something that's gonna fulfill the whole picture. Right, yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's hierarchy again, right? You have the, the big yeah. shot of the film and it breaks down all to its little pieces, right? And how the whole thing comes together because of that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. So, um, and, th and that's, I mean, it's not easy, but it's like, you know, th then again, that's when I say like, well, welcome to our world. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, but it makes you think. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, thank you, John, so much for sharing your wisdom and time with um, the audience today and, and your personal story. It was really great to hear about your journey and, you know, how you got into art. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, an amazing story for people to hear. There's so many out there just don't know how to break in. They want to get into the animation industry and 
Uh, some of them worried about age, you know, and you've proven also that you don't have to start at the age of 21 or 25, right? You come in later than that also. Yeah. You might be going to school and right now you might be taking calculus for all we know. <laughs> and that might be the beginning of, of a wonderful journey and something else. I don't know. <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And I would say, like, don't worry about failure. I mean, it's funny how you how, how the conversation started, like, drawing and, and just throwing stuff down. Right. Yeah. You, what you want to do is you always want to try and be in a position of being fearless and not being fearful. Um, basically, you have to ask yourself if you just don't care. Or, you know, if, to be frank, you know, sometimes you just, you just don't give enough, you know. Don't worry right. about it. Just just do it. It, it. And it's okay to make mistakes. You're supposed to make mistakes. We're human. Just throw it down. Um, I mean, Pixar has a saying, I think Andrew Stan and a few others, they had a talk where – they, you know, when they look, when they do movies, they want the whole, their, their saying is like to fail fast, knowing your fail, because they don't know their story, but allow the failure to happen because yeah. you need something to, to grow from, to work towards. So, you know, this is what we do. You know, a lot of the stuff that you see in an art book, a lot of people think like, oh, they do this the first time. No, what, right. you, what you didn't see is the hundred drawings that got you to these. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you're even aware of this, but I started this thing called Force Fridays on my YouTube channel. Uh -huh. uh, so every Friday at 1230, I go live with the other force instructors and we have different topics every week. And just yesterday, we talked about iteration and the power of failing early and failing fast and drawing fearlessly. It's all the stuff exactly that you just described, you know. And I think the most creative companies out there know that you know it's like you do have to make all your mistakes at the beginning right otherwise especially in animation you know when you ramp up a full team and you haven't solved some of those problems that potentially can get really expensive later right and derail an entire team yeah. on a movie right yeah so it's true i mean it's like i think i mean you can call them failures but you know just call them explorations they're going to get yeah. you to the right answer or at least to the to to a place where things are stronger you know, it, you know, and animation isn't easy. Drawing for animation design isn't easy. If it was easy, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to go to school for it. Right. You and know? everyone would be doing it and everyone yeah. would be in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a competitive field and, yeah. you know, anything that has to do with talent, you're competing with the hot shots. And it's like, okay, that just means you just have to step up your game and you have to be willing to take the challenge and, 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 and the struggles and everything that go with it. But you know, no one dies from it. You're going to be okay. This is growing. <laughs> right. uh, so it's like, welcome to that. You should, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about falling. Fall as much as you can, but just get yourself up and just go forward. What, you know, drawing, uh, falling down is expected. You know, welcome to the industry. I fall down every Monday when I get an assignment. <laughs> right. But I, I, you know, you, you have to like work it through and it'll be all right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John, so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Mike, for this. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.